Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome for com Welcome. Thank you for coming. Here we are. Okay. Welcome to the second class in the last part of our course, Moshiach Decoded. Um, this class is titled Calendar. Is there a time schedule for Moshiach's coming, and is he on schedule? That's a good question. In any case, I want to thank the Werdiger family from Australia, from Melbourne, for their dedication to these classes. I'm the sponsor of this class, may Hashem bless them. Big, big blessings. Okay. All right, so this is a very, very fascinating subject that we began last week. Last week, we had um, discussed and, 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 and developed the idea that when we look at the exile, um, and there is, there is generally, there is two, two, there is the possibility for Mashiach to come at any moment. That has to be understood, and that's a definite. Uh, we find that, that at the moment the exile began, the Gullahs began, the, 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 the sages tell us Mashiach was born. And as the Lubavitcher Rebbe explains, because the Abishter would not keep us in Gullus even for one extra second if we're worthy for the redemption, that's why there had to always be the possibility for Mashiach to come redeem us. So Mashiach is born, and as we spoke last week, if God wants it, even though Mashiach has to be a human being, he can be a baby that's just a day old. <laughs> because in co concept, the ability to redeem the Jewish people has to be there. But as we spoke last week, that's nuclear option. That means that that's not part of the order. That there is a set um, time for the Giyula, that the Giyula has to happen. And as I mentioned to you from the Abar Benel, that there's really three periods. Last week I quoted to you the Abar Benel, that there's three periods in, 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 in redemption. There is what's called Zman, the time that Mashiach cannot come, which means that there is a set time, and I also uh, quoted to you Maral, in which the Maral explains that there is a set time for exile, and that time can't be broken. The Gullus has to go that, that amount of time. And that, and, uh, but very important how I emphasized to you last week and explained this, that even though the Maral says, and the Barbanel, and so on and so forth, and there's many other indications to this, which some of it we will discuss this week as well, is that there is a set time that the exile must, must prevail. Um, that means that that's the system. It doesn't mean that God, the Abishter, can, you know, bypass the entire system. But we do have to appreciate that there is a system. And yet Hashem, for example, by Yetzirah Mitzrayim, there was also a system. The Golos was decreed for 400, in, for 400 years. Yet Hashem leaped over the system. Hashem suspended the system and brought the redemption after 210 years. But even then he respected the system. Because even then he counted, he, he rearranged the counting to count it from when Yitzchak was born. So technically when he gave a certain prediction of how long the Golos was going to be, God forbid Hashem did not speak chas v'shalom, anything but the truth. It's just that the question is how you count it. So there definitely is a system as a result of our tshuva, which we called last week the nuclear option, we can break everything and have the giyula, but yet there is a system. What's the system based on? So last week we discussed the various different explanations for gullus. And I mentioned to you last week that you know, we can look at gullus as punishment, and that's a true, but yet a chitzainiistic, external uh, outlook on the exile. And there's a deeper, a deeper idea of gullus. The deeper idea of gullus is that there is a... A, a, a higher purpose for the Jewish people being scattered amongst the exiles. That the fact that we are scattered amongst the exiles is for the deep mystical secret of what is more familiar known as Tikkun Olam, a Tikkun of the world, but on a much deeper level it means the elevation of the 288 sparks of holiness. Which what that really means is to uncover, to reveal the godly essence of every creature and every being across the entire world. Mystically, Kabbalistically, there is a, mystically and Kabbalistically, it is, it is known that there are Nitzutze Kedusha, there are sparks of holiness that for whatever reason ended up in an exiled state, in an entrapped state, covered by the, the klipa, covered by the forces of darkness that entrapped these godly potential. And the way we release these sparks of holiness is when 
a which means an uncover its godliness is when uh, we apply a mitzvah to a certain object to a certain phenomenon either directly we do a, we do a mitzvah with a with a with a you know with um, you take a candle and you light a Shabbos candle with it you've released you've uncovered godliness in this object or even if it's not directly uh, um, um, affected it's not directly an object is not directly used in a mitzvah because we appreciate and we understand that as much as the Jewish people have been doing mitzvahs across the world we've maybe touched directly not even a quarter of a percent or maybe even less than that of the physical objects of the actual world to do mitzvahs with it I mean to actual use you know how many even even uh, uh, um, what's it called again objects that we mamish do a mitzvah with like wool how much of the percentage of wool went into the mishkan or how much of the percentage of the wool that there is in the entire world went into making tzitzis very little but yet when we make one pair of tzitzis first of all we impact all the wool in the world in order to elevate that that's one idea and secondly all the energy that we use and all the elements in the world that are connected to a Jew doing a mitzvah which means that when when you get the energy to do a mitzvah for instance you're 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 going to visit someone in the hospital and uh, so you take a certain amount of energy to walk or to go and to go up the flights of stairs or whatever it is that you're doing that energy of that when you're doing God's mitzvah the energy of the mitzvah comes from all the food that you're eaten and the food that you're eating that too is elevated and not only is the food elevated but it's an amazing thing Whenever we do a mitzvah, we set off a chain reaction, what we might call a domino effect, which means the food that you eat, let's say you eat potatoes or whatever, you eat tuna fish, so that that food that you ate, the fisherman who's not Jewish, who's maybe living in Mexico, who knows where, who's, who's, who fished that fish, he's instrumental, instrumental in giving you that energy of doing this mitzvah, and in that sense, you're elevating a spark within this individual because this individual played a role in the observance of a mitzvah, which is God's will in the world, and enabled godliness then to be revealed through that person in Mexico, fisherman, who caught the fish. And if we realize that if all the Jewish people throughout ages doing all the mitzvahs that they've done and utilized all the objects, so yes, it is true that every single speck of time and space is involved in a mitzvah, God is the one who directs all of that to make sure that we finish our job. And it's interesting that it says, and if you're in, in all of Hasidus and in all of Kabbalist, in, 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 in Kabbalist form, many, many places, that this is our entire job and this dictates our life. Everything about our life, meaning how many years we're going to be alive, depends on how much is our sheared amount of sparks of holiness that we need to elevate. And even though I told you a number of 288 sparks, which doesn't seem to be that many, but as it's explained, mainly in Torah or in Parshas Vayeshev, that each one of these sparks gets splintered into a gazillion little pieces. So it's really gazillions of sparks. And, and our souls, everybody, the, in other words, in which time in history you live, you're born, in which country you live, all the places you live. So we're fortunate that our sparks ended up in California, so we have nice weather. But if for whatever reason we finish our work over here, then certain things happen in our life that we don't, that, that circumstances change, and we move away. You have people that haven't been expecting to move out of LA a year ago, and they're not here now, because certain circumstances carry them somewhere else. People think that the circumstances which bring us to different countries or to different cities or different places have our, 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 our own decisions. But really, Mashem et Sadeh Gover, as a, from Hashem, a person's feet are guided. It says that, that big tzaddikim, they see where their sparks are. And they go there consciously because they know that in this and this day, they need to travel so and so to make a bracha on a glass of water. They know that. Others, the rest of us, we don't have that, 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 that inner information. But we are guided by this mysterious power of the Abishter who causes what we call Mesaviv Kol Hasibais, the cause of all causes, directs us to various different things in order for us to rectify and to elevate the sparks that we need to, that we need to elevate. And I, as I mentioned many times in classes, when you're shopping and you, have, and you go to a store and sometimes you, you forget something. You leave the store and you forgot something and it's frustrating. You come home and you realize, oh, I forgot to buy something. And then you go back to the store again. Now why did the Abish have to waste your time? 
So you might think it's just, you, you, you know, of course, you know, if, if uh, your wife should blame you for forgetting to get the thing, right? But really, in truth, um, my answer, my good answer, it's not my fault. The spark of holiness, the potato that I needed to get, was happened to be sitting three rows below the upper surface. I would have never reached so low because I would have found nice potatoes on the top. So what happened is I needed to leave the store so someone else can come and take the potatoes that are on the second layer and on the first layer, and then I will come back because my potato is on the third layer, and then I will pick the one that is related to my spark of holiness. And it's, it's amazing because it's these little details which we think are meaningless, but these are really, really led by divine. How many times do you watch people picking up potatoes? They put one down, they pick up another one. And if you really, really ask them a question, why do you put that one down and take the other one? They can't explain. They think, you know, oh, this one maybe felt a little soft or whatever. That's true sometimes, but sometimes for no reason at all. It's because it's not theirs. And this is not their, their, their family for whatever reason. This, and even when you invite guests to your house, it's that piece of the potato kugel that belongs to that person that they are going to take. It's like, it's so guided, it's unbelievable. And that's why when Mashiach comes, we're going to be so stunned and so unbelievable by the unbelievable magnificent of this infinite wisdom of God, how everybody got exactly to their sparks at the moment they needed to get to it. And this is an unbelievable system. It's, a, it's, 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 it's like God's infinite computer that is able to direct every single spark and every single person exactly at the moment when they need to elevate and where they need to elevate and where they need to be. So this is the secret of Avodah Sabirim. And I want to share with you something I saw over Shabbos, which really completes what we learned last week. And I mentioned it on Shabbos, but it's so beautiful. In the end of Seif Parshas, in, 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 in Parshas Nitzavim, or in the beginning of Parshas Nitzavim, the end of Devarim, um, in Deuteronomy, it says like this. It says that Hashem says to the, to the, to the, to, to the Jewish people, how in the end, um, by, by, by us um, violating the covenant, Hashem says, I bring you a covenant covenant, I'm going to bring about the destruction of the land. And it says over there like how the Amru HaGoyim, the nations are going to say, Why did Hashem do this? Why is God so angry? And how is it that He, and it goes on to say that because the, and the Amru and they're going to say, Al berisi because they have forsaken my covenant and therefore Vayichar Af Hashem, Hashem is angry, Vayichem Alad Masam, and He has chased them away from their land, and so on and so forth, and that's what caused it. So the great Redomsker Rebbe, the Tveri Shloyma, asks the question, why only v'amru agoyim? The Gentiles will say, why won't the Jews be puzzled by their situation? We understand that if the Gentiles are puzzled by, their, by, by the suffering of the Jewish people, we're the ones suffering. So of course the Jewish people should ask the question, there, how can there be such an exile? How can there be such a golos? What's going on? Of course we're going to ask the question. So he answers like this. It's not the question. The question we, the Jewish people, are also going to have. But the Jewish people are never going to give that answer. The answer that God is angry at us, and that's why he has rejected us and thrown us out of the land, it's not going to sit well in our hearts because it's not the full truth. Of course, it's the surface truth. He says the Goyim are going to say that God is angry at the Jewish people and has kicked them out. But the Jew knows it's something much deeper. We know that our Father in Heaven loves us with a much deeper love and He couldn't have just kicked us out just because our misbehavior. And even if we misbehave, it shouldn't take 2,000 years for us to be able to work things out. So what then is the reason? Well, what's the next Pasuk right after He finishes saying what the Goyim will say? The hidden is to Hashem. means the hidden secret, the secret of exile is a deep mystical secret. It's a hidden thing. Now, it's a secret for, for many generations, but as it, it's predicted clearly in the Zohar, as we get closer to Mashiach's times, the secrets will be revealed. So this is the secret that, that the Arizal revealed, and then this became the teachings of all the Kabbalists and all those that are involved in what we call Pnimiya Satora, the inner part of the Torah, and specifically in the teachings of the Holy Baal Shem Tov and in the students of the Baal Shem Tov. And then in Tanya and all the teachings of Chabad. But it's not only, I'm telling you, it's the Ramchal is full of this. The Vilna Goyen's teachings are full of this. And which is the idea that the secret of the exile is that we have to rectify all the sparks of holiness. Now when is that accomplished? Is there a set time for that to be accomplished? Well, 
Obviously, the actual secret of the Giyul is an unknown thing. But again, as we get closer to the end, we, 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 we get kind of a sense of what's really going on. Based on what has been written throughout all, throughout all of, in, in, uh, what has been written in Torah throughout the, from the beginning of time. What seems to be the most um, common thread amongst all the early generations and later generations of rabbis trying to crack the code of the, of the redemption is that they're primarily following one major thing. Of course, you have Sefer Daniel, where Sefer Daniel gives you actually time, uh, times in, in years, but they follow one general principle. And the general principle is that Hashem created the world in six days. And, and we know that on Shabbos He rests. And, and we know what, what's the purpose of the six days? That God creates, He makes, He's, he's improving, He's making a creation. And Hashem asked us to be a shutif with Him. Hashem asked us to be partners with Him. So just like God creates the world in six days and on the seventh day He celebrates His beautiful creation, so too the world, as I mentioned last week, as, the, as, as it says in the Gemara, that the world follows these six days of creation. And that there are six millennia. And the sixth millennium is the time when mankind has to be partners with God, as it says, that Hashem created that we should do. And what does Lasis mean, as the Mepharshim say, as Rashi says in the Gemara's, Litake, it's our world of Tikkun. We work to perfect, to fix the world during the 6,000 years. And then in the seventh millennia, we have that perfected world. According to that, one might make a mistake and think that the real time for the coming of Mashiach is in the year 7,000. I'm sorry, in the year 6,000, which is 221 years from now which is a very painful thought, because no one is going to wait for 221 years. But if we really think about it and learn a little deeper, we find out that it's not that way. Not only does Mashiach, is Mashiach doesn't come in the year 6000, but the actual time for Mashiach is on Friday. You see, Mashiach, when you look at the creation of, 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 of the world, Hashem creates all kinds of creatures and beings and so on and so forth, but finally on Friday, Hashem creates the human being. And what is the human being? The human being is not created like on Shabbos. If Hashem wanted the human being just to be a, 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 a beneficiary of the beautiful creation that God created, so He should have created him already on holiday, on vacation day, on Shabbos day, the day that you enjoy. Hashem created Adam Arishon on Friday because what Adam Arishon's job is, His work is to complete the creation. Hashem creates the creation almost to the end, and then He wants man to become His partner to, create, to, to complete the creation. So even though the human being technically was created already five and a half thousand years ago, close to six thousand years, and we've been partnering with God in the process, but the main creation of man starts on Friday. And when is that Friday? That's the Friday of, of in the Cosmic Friday, the greater week. And what's that greater week? That's the sixth millennium from the year 5,000 to the year 6,000. That's the time when Adam Arishon is created. And his job is during his period in which he, is, he, he's, he reigns, because Hashem makes Adam the king over the creation, his job is to finish the work so that we can enter Shabbos. So what's Mashiach? Mashiach's work is not... Moshiach's work is not on Shabbos itself. Of course, Moshiach will continue being then and being a leader for the Jewish people and the world will elevate higher and higher. But his main work is to finish the Friday work so that we can prepare the world for Shabbos. So the time of Moshiach is not reward. The time of Moshiach is a time when we perfect. The, up till Moshiach, we do all the hard labor. And then once Mashiach comes, Mashiach himself comes to complete the final perfections that are needed to be able to enter into Yom Shakul Shabbos. So therefore, Mashiach's period is actually on Friday. Now, when on Friday, this is what we're going to discuss, to try to figure out when on Friday. The amazing thing is that what it seems like, what Chazal have said, what or I brought to you from the Bar Benel, that there's three periods. There's the time when Mashiach cannot come. There's the time that Mashiach possibly can come during that time. And then there's this man hachiyov, that when this time comes, he must be here. 
So, and that's like the ultimate mystery. When is this man achiyuv that Mashiach must be here? Well, based on all this information, we can actually figure out when Mashiach must be here by. And you'll all be shocked, maybe, maybe you won't be shocked, to hear that that time passed already. In that sense, the question is, so where is Mashiach? And the answer is, maybe he's here, but we're missing him. Which is a, which, which is a very, very, very deep idea. Well, let's, 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 let's try to appreciate that. What's this idea that Mashiach, what's that time? Is, is there a calendar that we can follow? So, first of all, I'd like to share with you, based on what I just told you, it's a passage of the Zohar. Um, on, where is it over here? Oh, that's right. Passage of the Zohar, this idea that I mentioned. It says, Rabbi Yazar and Rabbi Akiva have a Ozla Ba'orcha. Rabbi Yazar and Rabbi Akiva were walking. Amalai Rabbi Akiva Rabbi. Rabbi Akiva says to his Rebbe, this is in Zohar Chadash Bereshis. Ma, um, Taf Tezayin Dalit. It says like this. Ma Roha Kaddish Baruchu. Um, what it means that Tezayin Dalit, I'm not exactly sure. I looked it up in the Zohar and said, I'm actually reading it from a Yalkut Mashiach Hagu Ula Torah. But I, do, I did look it up in the Zohar in the past, but I don't have the actual uh, thing in front of me right now. But anyways, this is Mamish, the quote of the Zohar. It says, Rabbi Akiva says to his, to, to, Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva is a student of Rabbi Eliezer. And he says, Why did Hashem only create the human being on Friday? So that man should not be able to create credit that he helped God and create. In other words, a human being would tell a frog, <laughs> I'm your creator. So therefore Hashem made sure to create everything before so that the human being will not be able to argue that he's anything that was created. Okay. Anyways, as they continued walking, that was his first answer. Rabbi Eliezer stopped. He put down his head. He put his, he put his, he put his, his hand on his mouth. And he cried. It's almost like as he's walking, He's suddenly hit by something, a reality, and he puts his hand on his mouth, and he's so terrified, and he begins to cry. Amalei Rebbe Akiva. Rebbe Akiva says to him, Rebbe, lama at bachi. Rebbe, why are you crying? Amalei al dada she'iltan. The question you just asked me, I'm crying. Chiza chaziz v'kashi amila. I've seen something, but it's very difficult for me. Akiva, Akiva, he says, Akiva, my student, man yiskalahai orcha de galusa. Who is going to be able to wait it out? The length of this exile. This mashach, it's going to be so long. The man who's going to come with the clouds of heaven, he's not going to come ad yoimishtisa. He's not going to come until the sixth day, till Friday. You understand? Rabbi Yazar and Rabbi Akiva are living before the beginning of the fifth millennium. They're living 50 years after the destruction of the Beis Amigdash. So who would believe? You know, one of the reasons why you don't find from the early, early writings so much about the time that we're in right now, because even if they knew the secret, no one wanted to say it. Because who would have written such things to discourage the Jewish people that they're still going to have to wait another 1800, 1900 years? And the only thing that we made it through our exiles because we waited for Mashiach every moment. And we were always, and the truth is, it was always an option. Because if we did tshuva, really powerful tshuva, we could have went past all these all these, all these set um, 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 times. But in any case, he says, Mashiach is not going to come until the sixth millennium. Oh, but he says, not at the end. No, don't think it's at the la- in the year 5,999, Mashiach is going to come. That's not the time. Not in its end. He says specifically in the Zohar, if we do tshuva, he can come before the sixth millennium. But other than that, and he doesn't say a regular tshuva. He says a very intense tshuva. We can get Mashiach before the sixth millennium. Because his reign and his rule of Mashiach Tzadkenu is only in the sixth millennium. And then, in the seventh, the world is going to be in a manner of charuv. Charuv doesn't mean destroyed, even though it seems like it. It means that the concealments of creation, olam, which means concealment, is going to be nullified and we're going to be living in a world completely marinating in godliness. Anyways, this is what he says. This is a Zohar. Clearly stated way back then 
Now the Zohar has many prophecies, mamish prophecies, things that you see already happened, where the Zohar talks about how in the sixth millennium, and so on and so forth, and within a certain time, within the sixth millennium, the gates of wisdom are going to open up, and, and which is preparing the world for Mashiach. And that is in the year, the Zohar says, in the year 6,600. I'm not going to quote that today, but we're going to leave that for another class. As we're going to speak more about the content of what happened throughout history in all these periods that we're going to be talking about. Today I don't want to talk about the content of what happened. I just want to talk about the actual calendar. What does it say? Okay. Now, now what the Zohar says very briefly is discussed more... Um, elaborately in various different writings of the Rishonim. I will start with the Ramban. In the Pasuk, in, in, the Ramban has a Pirush, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, has a Pirush on Shir Hashirim. In the end of his Pirush on Shir Hashirim, in the last, second to the last Pasuk, the, Ra, the Ramban says like this, there's a Pasuk that says, a elef lecha shloima, a thousand to you shloima, or whatever a elef means. And I think Chazal say that that's the only time when it says Shlomo in, uh, in, in, in Shir Hashirim, which is Choyl, which is weekday. Which means, I'm weekday, I mean, it's, 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 it's mundane, it's not holy. Every other time it's referring to God. But in any case, it says like this, Zeu Choyl, Veremez Bikan, it is indicating over here, in this Pasuk, Ha'elef Lecha Shloima, Al Yomoy Mashiach, on the days of Mashiach, Shu Elef Shanim. Ramban says that the days of Mashiach are a thousand years. Hua Elef Hashishi, which is the sixth millennium, which consists, which coincides, we said earlier, it's Friday. Friday of creation, that's the time for Mashiach. Mishnois Oilam from when the world was created, Shem Sheshes Allah Shanam. That's called Yemoisa Mashiach. Now, that does not mean that Mashiach is going to be here at the first moment of that. Of the of the of the of the year five thousand. The year five thousand, by the way, comes out in the year twelve forty. That's not so. He doesn't say Mashiach is going to come at the very very beginning of it, but he just says that that's called Yemoisa Mashiach. Um, and he brings over here Ata Bechola Elef Hu Yemoisa Mashiach. That a whole thousand years, the entire millennium is the days of Mashiach. Shenachaka al we're going to wait for his coming. That's the time that we have to actually wait for his coming. Kishiyya Ratzan Aboyre, when the will of God is going to be within that thousand, Yekafi Asaydir Anal, it will be according to the order. Now, more specifically, Ramban makes a calculation in this Pirish and Shira Shirim that the time within Friday that Mashiach has to come is about. 180, 182 years after the beginning of Elef HaChamishi, Elef, ha, Elef HaShishi, which means two 200 years. And, he, and it, there's an 18 year period, he's talking about one Mashiach and then another Mashiach and so on and so forth. But in, in Shir HaShirim, and his Pirish in Shir HaShirim, the, the Ramban predicts and speaks about the redemption happening in the year 1440. It's Friday. Moshiach is supposed to be here already. Based on the idea that Adam Arishon is created on Friday. Now we are going to see soon that there is, if we take a thousand years, and we say a thousand years is, is one of Hashem's days. Now what's this whole basis? What's this whole basis? That we go through, we follow the six days of creation. Because it says in, in Tehillim, it says, ki That to God, oh, one day, is a thousand years. So therefore, we look at each day as a thousand. But, the question is, that thousand years, do we, do we divide it in two as nighttime and daytime? Or do we just look at the, at the thousand years as Friday and there's no... And there's, so interesting, from the Ramban and from other Mepharshim, it seems that they don't differentiate between night and day. You can understand why, because they were not going to have it, that we have first another 500 years of darkness and then only the morning. I don't know if consciously they, didn't want, they, 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 they knew that and didn't want it, or subconsciously they were going to hear it. But there is a discussion about it in the, in the Kabbalistic Sfarim. They bring this question on the Ramban. Meaning, do we count the sixth millennium? Do we count it direct? In other words, the year 1240, which is the beginning, which is the year 5000 from when the world was created, is that considered the morning of Friday, 
Or is that considered Thursday night? Shkia, the, 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 sun, the stars come, uh, you, know, you know, three stars, and it's becoming Friday, Leil Shishi, the night of, of... So the Ramban and others ignore the idea that there is a nighttime and there is a daytime. But the later Mikubalim, who lived later, do discuss and bring out this idea that there is a night and a day. We're going to get that in a moment. So here's where the Ramban says clearly. There's also a Baal Haturim, Parshas Bereshis. Here's the Baal Haturim, Parshas Bereshis. Not a Parshas Bereshis, and Sefer Bereshis. Um, Parshas Vayishlach, okay? The Baal Haturim from the Rishonim. Our Shulchan Aruch is based on the tour. Yaakov sends to Esav, okay? And he sends him um, messengers that I'm coming. He says, I lived with Lavan. And I delayed until now. Now, Kabbalistically, we know that the Moshiach's coming has to do with some kind of a rectification of Esav. So Yaakov is sending to his brothers, Esav, I'm coming, but I have delayed until now. So he says, What's that delay? He's that in the word ad ata, in the word ata till now, is hinted to the redemption. He says like this, um, the ayin of the word ata until now represents the 70 years, ayin shel bavel, the 70 years of the Babylonian exile. The tuf of the word ata represents the 400 years shel mitzrayim of the exile of Egypt. And then the hay of ata, represents 5,000 years from creation until the time of Mashiach. The Yavoy Elaf Hashishi, and the sixth millennium will come, which is the year 5,000. Shehem Yamoisa Mashiach, which they are the days of Mashiach. The Achakach afterwards, the Olo Mashiach Bahar Tzion, Lishpoit Eshar Esav. In other words, Yaakov is saying, I am coming to you. I'm coming to complete my rectification of Esav. So even the Baal Aturim, and you realize these people lived before that time. And they are talking that when is Mashiach, the, the period, the time of Mashiach, Elef Hashishi, the sixth millennium. Now what, I am, what I'm going to share with you in terms of sources is literally a drop of the bucket because so much places to look from in Zohar and so many places. I'm just giving you a, little, a few little nuggets so that you see, but this is something that is all across the board. One of the most fascinating places where this is actually discussed is in the book of Bereshus, when the story of creation happens, by three giants of commentary of Torah. One is Ramban, we mentioned him earlier, or Moshe ben Nachman. The other one is Rabbeinu Bachaya, And the third one is the Abar Benel. All three of them discuss that the story of creation, I'm just going to read, quote you a small little something of it. Yeah. All three of them discuss the story of creation, of the six days of creation, as actually telling us what's going to unfold in history. The six days of creation. And they say like this, primarily, I'm just going to give you a quick re, a, a quote from Rabbeinu Bachaya. This is in Parshas Bereshis, in Rabbeinu Bachaya, if you want to look it up, it is in Paso Gimel, Perek, Perek Beis Paso Gimel. Rabbeinu Bachaya says, you should understand, at the set seven days of creation, Mavaram Lanu, Masha Ova, Veroimzum Lanu, Allah Asid. It's telling us our past and what is going to happen in the future. The Hinehem Keneget Shita Alpha Shnin, it corresponds to the 6,000 years, the Chad Chariv, and then the seventh, which is the Shabbos. Because Yoyim Eshalach Kadish Baruchu Elef Shana, because by Hashem a, a, a day is a thousand years. Ki Elef Shana Benecha Ki Yoyim Esmo. V'Dover Baruchu. It is a clear thing. Shakol Yoyim V'Yoyim Meshesis Yemei Bereshis Ela. That every day of these six days of creation, who Roimez La Advarim or Asidim Liyos Ba'Olam, is symbolizing things that are going to happen in the world. Ba'Oisaya Elef in that thousand years. Shekeneged Ayom. And these great rabbis who had pure eyes, were able to look into the Torah and read the story of creation and see it as a map, as a timeline of history. So briefly, Ramban says the same thing, and Rabbeinu Bachai and Abar Benel, their description of how, what each day means is slightly different. I'll give you a very quick, brief overview of what they're saying. On the first day of creation was a lot of light, and because it was a lot of light, means that that first thousand years is going to be a time of great brightness. 
and that's the way it was. Adam Arishan was alive. Now we don't realize who Adam Arishan was. He was created by God, and even though he sinned, and sadly some of us sometimes look at him like, you know, like a failure, but he's still Adam Arishon, and therefore he's the person who knew God in a sense more than any other person ever will know Hashem. According to mystical teachings, he had the highest level of neshama next to Moshiach, even higher than Moshe Rabbeinu. His mere presence in the world was a tremendous light for the creation. It's also a time of tremendous godly kindness because people had so much blessings. No one was ill, everybody lived long lives that lived close to a thousand years. It was a spectacular time. The second millennium is the time of the, 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 the second day, Monday, is the day that, you, 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 that Hashem makes a division between the upper waters and the lower waters. It's the one day of creation that it doesn't say kitov. It doesn't say it's good because it's not a good day. And so the way they, the, 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 the Rabbeinu Bachaya says, what happened on that day is the marble. And that's the idea of this, the, work, the work with the water and so on and so forth. The flood came and it destroyed the entire world. Um, according to... Um, the the uh, Ramban, I think. Let's take a look in Ramban. The the second um, the second thousand years. Okay. Okay. The Oh, but then God separated the higher waters and the lower waters. In the lower waters. Ramban says that means that God separated one family from the rest of humanity to save them, and the rest of humanity was destroyed. That's the separation that Hashem made. According to Yabar Benel, interesting, he says that the separation that God makes between, between waters and waters is not referring to the separation of Noah, but the separation of Avram Avinu. Because Avram Avinu was born 48 years before the end of the second millennium being over and moving into the third millennium. So therefore, he, he counts Avram Avinu still as a product of the, I'm sorry, the product of the first millennium. No. A product of the second day, which is the second millennium, and not the third day. Ramban says, no, Avram Avinu belongs to the third day of creation. And the fact that he's born before it becomes Tuesday, it's still Monday, it's, it's 48 years before the beginning of Tuesday, shouldn't bother you, he says, because we know there's a concept called Bein Hashmashais. It's in between days. And you'll see, he says in history, that many of the things that belong in the following millennium precede and happen already in the last days of the earlier millennium. Similar also like Mashiach, which is really a phenomenon related to the seventh millennium. It happens, it already conquers a piece of Friday, and Friday we live already in tremendous godly enlightenment. Okay, so that happens on Monday. What's on Tuesday? On Tuesday Hashem made the world beautiful. Hashem, let the earth give forth, um, 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 what's it called again, uh, uh, desha, which means vegetation, and there's flowers, and there's food, and there's, the world is becoming livable. And more than that, until that time, the world was covered with water. You couldn't, it wasn't possible. The world wasn't possible for humans to live on, on the planet. And then it became possible for civilization to take root. So in the third millennium, and it says that God, it's a very special day, Tuesday, God said two times it's good. And as they all explain, again, each one in their own words, it's referring to the Jewish people, first of all, Avram Avinu being born and beginning to teach knowledge of God to the world. Again, not being born then, but his Avram Avinu's main life, at least that the Torah tell, speaks about him, was from when he's 75 years and older. That's already in the third millennium in part of Tuesday. And the Ramban says, and um, during that time, you have the going out of Egypt. That's one time, Kitov. And the other time, Kitov, is that the Torah was given. God revealed himself on Har Sinai, and the Torah was given, and mitzvahs were given to the world, and that's also called the vegetation, the fruits, and so on and so forth. So this is the general idea of what happened in the third millennium, which was Tuesday, a phenomenal period of time. Then came the fourth millennium. Fourth millennium, God, on, on, two, on Wednesday, God created the two, the sun and the moon. So that represents the period of time in which, again, it's going to be a lot of godly light in the world, and Ramban and Abar Benel both refer to that it's referring to the first temple and the second temple. First base on Migdash is, is the sun, the second temple is the moon. And the prophets, they're the stars that were creating, that were illuminating the world during that period of time. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says the, first, the, 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 the sun is the Torah Shebeksav, the written Torah. Even though it wasn't given during that millennium, but that was the time that we studied it and revealed it. And the second and the small uh, luminary is Torah Shebaal is the, is, the, is the oral law. And the stars, he says, are all the, mish, the brysos and the mishnas and all this that were revealed during that time that illuminate creation. 
But again, you see this, the system that, go, that goes through creation. Then comes a day, the day of Thursday. On Thursday, God created all the creepy, crawly stuff that are annoying. And that's what happened on Tuesday of, of, of creation. I'm sorry, on Thursday of creation. On Thursday of creation was a very harsh period of time. That's the time when the Beis Amigdash is destroyed, actually. The Beis Amigdash was destroyed 172 years before the completion of the fourth millennium. In other words, really the destruction of the Beis Amigdash and the Golos is supposed to be on Thursday. And only on Thursday. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote you a couple of, the time of exile that was, is like a must for the Jewish people is a thousand years. And, and that thousand years is the thousand years from the beginning of the fifth, uh, of the, from the beginning of the fifth millennium to the sixth millennium, which means from the year fourth, from the year 4,000 to the year 5,000. That's the period. And that's the meaning of all these creepy insects that, and he says the Jewish people, the Lushan of the Ramban is, let me read you. Yoim Chamishi, I'm reading Rabbeinu Bachaya. Keneged Elof HaChamishi, Shaboya Yinu Shriyum Begolos Beinu Umois. We are in exile amongst the nations. Shehem Nemsholos Lenefesh Chaya Harei Meses. They're compared to the insects that are crawling. Vekulay Mitchilasei Vatsoifai Hoyolanu Boi Golos. This entire time is when we have exile. Vaalkein Loi Nemar Beyoim HaChamishi Vayehi Kain. It doesn't say, see how Hashem is so careful, Hashem is careful. Hashem doesn't say, it will be so, because this has to end. The f- whatever is created on Thursday cannot last. So it doesn't say, it's the only day that it doesn't say, it will be so, because that would mean that the, there's some impact, the scars and the wounds of exile have to last forever. No, it doesn't say, if you ain't gala say no the oil, our gallows will not be forever. Avil achri say no ligaula, our our future will be the redemption. Our Barbanel says that there's a difference. On that day, God created the creepy crawly stuff, but then he also created uh, the, 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 the he created the birds. And he says this, these, these are two different types of, of powers that were that 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 were that were that were ruling over the world during the during the dark ages. This is called the dark ages, period of time. There are creepy crawly rulers, these are petty little rulers that just inflict their subjects with a lot of pain. And then there are a few major empires, larger empires, and they compare to the birds. Who exactly what he's referring to, various different kingdoms, different monarchies, different, 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 which represent the higher, uh, the, the, the power, uh, power of, 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 of the larger birds, birds of prey. But then comes, then comes Yom Shishi. Now, now let me stop for a moment. Since I'm mentioning already Thursday, and we just mentioned that Thursday is the day of exile. It's a very dark day. I would like to quote you from the Arizal. It's Chaim. From the Arizal. We know that the six days of creation, Kabbalah, see, till now I didn't, we haven't really introduced any Kabbalah, any, Kabbalah, any, any mysticism. Here's a mystical idea. Even though the Rabbeinu Bahaya, Ramban, these are all great m- mystics. But over here it says like this, in the Arizal, in Shar Hechov, um, this is called Shar Hayereach Perek Hey. There's this portal related to the, to the moon, Perek Hey. The moon is is a muscle for Malchus and the like. He explains like this. Um, oh, he says like this. We know that the six days of creation are related to six spherot. Chesed. And the first day is related to chesed, the attribute of kindness. Second day is gevura, and so forth. Because this, the reason there are six days is because God created the world through his six emotions. And every day is another emotion. That's why the first day, chesed, is kindness. It was a beautiful time. The third millennium is teferis. Teferis is compassion and beauty. So it's a beautiful time. But Thursday, he says, is the time, it's called hod. Now hod, which means glory. But if you take the word hod, and you rearrange the letters of hod, you get the word dove. Dove means an ache and a pain. Al zehaya dove li beinu. On this, our heart is aching. He says in hod, in that part of 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 the spherot, the forces of klipa are able to get in. Where do we find that? When Yaakov Avinu was fighting against the, the angel, where did the angel hit him? In the thigh. So the thighs are, are and the thighs represent Netzach and Hod are the two, two thighs. The two, right, the two right arms 
I'm sorry, the two arms are chesed and gavur. In the middle, the torso is, represents teferes, and the two legs and the two thighs are netzach and hod. Nehepach v'naseh dove. So from hod it becomes dove. My glory was, confer- was converted, gets transformed, Lamashchis to a destructive force. And he goes in to explain how this has to do with a woman's time, her period. Because that's a, a woman during her, her time, her period is also called Dove, that, she, that, that she's, she has a period, and the period means that she can't be close to her husband. So this is the time when Knesset Yisrael, the Shekhinah, the Jewish people, are are in a, a state of separation from God. Um, You've given me to be completely desolate. The whole day I am dove. I'm aching. But what is a deeper meaning, he says? It means the whole thousand years. Yoim is a thousand years. Over here I will teach you an incredible secret. The days of exile are a thousand years. The whole day is dove. The world stands for 6,000 years. It's from kindness until your soul, which is bonding. The seventh millennium is kingship. And that's where God's kingship is going to be completely revealed in the whole world. Shu Shabbos. Okay. So, Hoya Samuch la Elef Achluch. Vihine Churbin Beis Amigdash. The destruction of the Beis Amigdash. Hu Samuch la Elef Achamishi. Happens close to the fifth millennium. Shu Hoid. Kiboy na Chazem Achitzonim. That's where the Chitzonim take hold. Leos Gevura is Kashes. Hold is, a very, is an offshoot of Gevura. Just like the first, think about it. The first millennium of Gevura, which was Monday. Monday and Thursday are two harsh days. So on Monday, it says that the courts used to sit on Monday and Thursday because these are days of dinim, of judgment. So on Monday of creation, what happened? All of humanity was destroyed. The Mabel came. And on Thursday of creation, which is an offshoot of the left side, what happens? The, the, the base of English is destroyed. It's a time of good. The, the real exile is only during this time. Kamay Shekasa Bizar, as stated in Zohar, the Yishlit to Amamin be Yisrael, the nations will not dominate over the Jewish people. Yoiser Me'elef Shnin, more than a thousand years. Ki ein lem achiza rak b'hoid levad. They only have an achiza. Now, you're asking a question. Uh, how, do we, how do we reconcile? The nations don't have an achiza on the Jewish people more than a thousand years when we're already close to 1900 years and we're still in exile. Okay. Do I have an answer? I'm not going to tell you if I have an answer. But let's see. For now, for now. We'll see. But anyway, this is what it says in, 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 from the Arizal. So again, the main exile, and you see that. Rabbeinu Bechaya, Arbar Benel, Ramban, all follow along that same line of thinking. That the thousand years of exile, and then begins possibility for Mashiach to come, which is in the beginning of the sixth millennium. Fine. Yoim Shishi, but now how about on, on uh, the Amosai, when does Mashiach come? Yoim Shishi, Says Rabbeinu Bechaya, Sheyavai Mashiach, that's when Mashiach comes. Shehiskir Kenegdoi Nasa Adam. Let us make man. Who is the man we've been waiting for? That's Mashiach. That's why we know that the, it's been written from the earlier, earlier uh, commentators that the word Adam stands for Adam David Mashiach. So the ultimate realization of Adam, of Adam, is, is Mashiach. Yaim Shishi, he says, is Kenegda Elaf Shishi, that we're already into it. Uh, 51 years, I don't know if he means we have 51 years to it or whatever, or we're there already. Anyways, and we're going to come out of it during that time. Uh, Just like Adam Arishan was created on the morning of Friday, Mashiach will come on the morning of Friday. Now it's so interesting how he and the Ramban both ignore that you should really count 500 years for darkness. They so didn't want to deal with it that they just skip it. And they say, it has to take, you know, you have to wait until the tenth of the day, which is Neitzachama, when the sun will rise. So, you have, so therefore he says, how many days? 118 years after the beginning, after the end of Elva Chamishi. Anyways, to, to fulfill what, what Daniel says. 
So here you have Ramban, Ram, those, they're all following this calendar, the calendar of creation. Now, what I'd like to do, being that we, we have to wrap up the class, so as I mentioned to you, the, the, the time frame is following the calendar. But as we said, the, the earlier we show them, and there are those who want to say, and they, and, they, and they wanted it, obviously, this way, to skip the 500 years of night. But after all, there is a 500 years of night. So for that, I'd like to share with you the teachings of the Orachayim HaKadosh. So the Orachayim HaKadosh, one of, again, lived before the Balshem Tov, or in the period of time of the Balshem Tov in Eretz Yisrael, about 300 years ago. Great, great, great Sadik, mystical Sephardic, um, saintly, saintly, holy man. It is known that if the Baal Shem Tov would have met together with the Erechayim HaKadosh, the Baal Shem Tov tried so much to go up to Eretz Yisrael just to meet him. Had these two people met together, Mashiach would have been here. So let me quote to you what the Erechayim HaKadosh says in Parshas Pinchas. Unbelievable words. He says like this. It's talking about the various different families. It's counting the Jewish people. And over there it says like this. B'nai Yehuda, the family of Yehuda. Parshazu, this is in Perek. Chavav, Pasuk Yutes. Parsha Zu Tirmois, Moirois, and Bnei Yisrael. This parsha is coming to hint to us things that are going to happen to the Jewish people. And he's hinting it all in the family of Yehuda because Yehuda is the family of, the, of kingship. And more than that, the Jewish people are called Yehuda. We're called Jews. Jews means Judah. So we're all called Yehuda, so in the family of Yehuda. And he says, Yehuda, the Pasuk says that Yehuda has two children, Er the Onan. And Er and Onan died. They sinned and they died. So he says like this, Er and Onan are referring to the two golden periods of Jewish history. Er is referring to the first Beis Amigdash, two children of Yehuda. And Onan is referring to the second Beis Amigdash. He says the word Er comes from the word Or. Or means awake. That's the time when God was awake and watching over the Jewish people with his full hashgacha, the greatest presence of God in the world, open manifestation of Hashem was during the first Beis Amigdash. Onan comes from the word, comes from the word um, oina, being cheated. Because the second temple, we were cheated because we never really got back all the light of the first temple. As we know that the five main things that were missing in the, in the, in the, the five great indications of the dwelling of God in, in the, amongst the Jewish people was removed from us when... In the second base of English, we didn't have the fire coming down from heaven. We didn't have the Urim Vitumim, which is the special breast, the power in the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol to be able to tell the Jewish people future and things, you know, answer questions. Many things were removed from the Jewish people during the second base of English. Nevuah stopped, prophecy and the like. So therefore, the second base of English is, oh, they didn't even have the ark in the second temple. It was hidden, but they didn't have it openly. So that's why it's called Onan. Then it says, Vayamas erva onan, erva onan died, is referring to what? It's referring to the, the death, is referring to the destruction of both Beis Amigdash, because the Shekhinah left, the soul left, and the buildings collapsed. Then he goes on to say, what happens in the next Pasuk? Vayihi b'nei Yehuda le'mishpechaisam, so now what are the children of Yehuda? Sheila. Now comes Sheila. Who's Sheila? That's Mashiach. Shiloh. Mashiach is called Shiloh, present to him. And he says that um, uh, B'nai Yehuda, uh, yeah, that, 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 but he says an interesting, the reason why Vayihi, Vayiyu B'nai Yehuda, Vayiyu, whenever it says Vayiyu, it means Vayiyu, pain there will be. B'nai Yehuda L'Sheila, what does that mean? He says that the Jewish people are supposed to be pained for Mashiach Tzadkenu. Because Mashiach, Mashiach himself suffers tremendously. Because he takes upon himself the brunt of the suffering of the Jewish people. So he says the Jewish people have to feel the pain for Mashiach. And be pained, not just by our pain, but by the pain that Mashiach Tzadkenu has for us. But then he goes on to say, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it will take too long. In the end it concludes and it says, the Eila Mishpachos Yehuda, these are the families of Yehuda. Shisha v'shivim ela v'chamesh meyos. Lifkudeem to their numbers. How many? How many children are there for Yehuda? One thousand and seventy-six. I'm sorry, no, no. Um, Seventy-six thousand five hundred. So this is what he says. This is what it means. He means pekida, the time of remembrance. What's going to be the time of remembrance? 
76,500. So he breaks it down like this. The six, the six that it's referring to is referring to six generations from exile of Egypt. Because you begin with Yitzchak, starts the exile. Because when Hashem promised Avram, your children are going to be in exile. You start with Yitzchak, then it's Yaakov, the second generation. And Hashem tells Yaakov, the, your fourth generation is going to return. Daraviu, Raviu, you know, Hashem tells Avram Avinu, Daraviu, Yeshiva, Heina, fourth generation from Yaakov. So it's another four generations, and that's, so these are six. That's the six generations. That's the, that's the six. Shivim, 70, is referring to the 70 years of the exile of, Bab, of Babel. What's the 1,500? Elef Chamesh Meois, 1,500. So here, this is, this is just magnificent. Um, Ukeneged Golos Edoim, corresponding to Golos, that we're still in this exile. He says, 1,500. The Imho Yezoich in Yisrael, if the Jewish people would have married, that means that the time of exile, the Zohar, remember, I told you was a thousand. He says from here it implies, no, that's going to be added another 500. Why? Because you need the night time, which is half the 500. So therefore, it's, you, can, you, you knock off another 500 years, which is the night time of, 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 of Elif HaShishi, of Thursday night. V'kivan Shaloi Zachu. So if we would have merited, it would have began 172 years before the beginning of the fifth millennium. Because the destruction of the Beis Amigdash, remember we said, came early. So we could have started the 1500 years earlier, but we were in Zeichah. And therefore, when is the Cheshbon going to start? When is the calculation going to start? It's the time of Mashiach is 1,500 years from the 6th millennium. And when we are hoping, and this is in his days, and everything that was promised, and here's what the main line that I want you to remember and remember and remember. That in the beginning of the next 500 years, which corresponds to the year 1740, at the year 1740, 5,500, Shnas Tafkuf, 5,500, 5,500, it's in this time the sparks of the redemption, of the revelation of the redemption is going to begin. This is the Erechayim HaKadosh speaking in Eretz Yisrael. Okay? 1740. Just about the time of the revelation of Hasidus, but I'm going to leave that for, the, and which are sparks of the redemption. Now interesting, so you'd think, okay, it's a Hasidic Indian, but let me show you. The Vilna Goyen makes the same calculation. The, 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 the Goyen of Vilna, okay? So this is, he, he says over here in... There's a sefer called Koil Hator, which is from a student of the Vilna Goyen. And he says, um, It's a fascinating book where he mamish doesn't, the Vilna Goyen was so bent on Mashiach, like you wouldn't, you would be surprised to hear that. He's a fascinating Makubal, and he's real, and here's what he says. Um, uh, hold on. Um, oh no, I missed it over here. Hapkida Rishayna sheheschila maschila oira boiker shel ameya hashishes. In the beginning of the morning, he makes the same idea that there is night time and there is morning time. La elaf hashishi yehudai hagadol sherabenu hagra bepasuk evan. And anyways, the students of the Vilna Gaon, and I think even the Vilna Gaon himself saw himself as the Vilna Gaon, because the Vilna Gaon, which people don't, in, in, the, in the Litvisha world, don't realize this. I mean, those who are familiar with the Vilna Gaon, they do, but some people don't realize the Vilna Gaon was a tremendous proponent for learning, studying mysticism. Tremendous. The Vilna Gaon writes so harshly against people that do not study, that in our time, everybody, and, and, and not learning mysticism is holding back the redemption. And anyways, he saw himself as a tremendous revealer of mystical secrets of the Torah. He saw his name in certain psukim. Kimiyad Achreze, and afterwards begins the war against Amal. So he says, it, again, that is in the year Shnas Tavkuf, again in the year 1740. 
And then he says, The next, there's going to be a war against Amalek. Then comes going into the land. That is, hashishi. When you start the 700 years, means that the, the, uh, um, um, which means um, 5,600. 100 years later. It's going to start the return of the Jewish people to Eretz Yisrael. And so on, he makes the cheshven. But upon him, you see from here that the Vilna Goyen is in sync together with the Eur and with what it says in many Hasidic writings, that that's the time of redemption. Comes the, the Balatanya in his, in, in his Sefer Mamarim Admur Azakim, which I have it right over here in front of me. Um, where did I put it? Oh, right over here. The Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, and his, his Sefer is, a, is an amazing mime. I'm just going to show you very clearly. He says, with Parshas Pinchas, he brings the Orachayim, the Oilam Adevrenu, Shas Cholas Nitzutze Geula, the beginning of the, this is in my Mare Admar Azak and Parshas Pekude, the beginning of the sparks of the redemption, Hoya Metchilas Tov, and he's talking different. He's not saying it will be, because the Alter Rebbe is already living after the year 5,500. Um, okay, the Alter Rebbe, this is in 1740, the Alter Rebbe is born later. So he writes, it actually happened. Mitchilas tov kuf la'elaf hashishi. Alpi, and he adds one thing. Tzedoike, tzadike kedoyshe elyoin. Shehoye bahaschales tov kuf la'elaf hashishi. Tzadikim, the whole super, tzadikim of like the highest caliber that were in the beginning of the fifth millennium. I'm sorry, of the sixth millennium. Not, not the beginning of the sixth millennium. The beginning of, fra, of, of, of the daytime of the sixth millennium, referring to the Baal Shem Tov and his students. Can you do as it is now? Like it says in the Zohar that there won't be such a generation until Mashiach will actually come. So there was a tremendous influx of tremendous tzaddikim that lived at that time in 1740 and in the period immediately following that. The fifth Chabad Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab, has a mimer, a fascinating discourse in the year Tafrei Samach Gimel where he discusses this whole period and he says how the Baal Shem Tov, again, most of this information I'm going to give you when we're going to talk about where these things actually happened, but he, he, he discusses this at great length, how the period of time, um, he goes through the years, what happened when and when. In the year 1740, the coming of the Baal Shem Tov, he says it's the morning of Friday, and that's why it's the beginning of the tasting of the food of Mashiach. And he goes through that in Friday itself, there's period of time because Friday morning is Alosa Shachar, it's dawn. Then it's Neit Sachamu, you can read Shema. That's already when the sun comes out, that's a little later. And these are all increase, the increase of tremendous messianic light and godly revelation. And he actually points what this all is referring to. And then he actually gives a date when Mashiach is going to come. And he points to the year 1907 for the year of the coming of Mashiach. Tafresh Samach Vav which he says that's the time of, of, of Shemona Esrei. The earliest Shemona Esrei, Zman Tvila, the time of Shemona Esrei of Friday. The time went, and Luchura, at first glance, seems like Mashiach didn't come in that year. But as we're going to see soon, all these dates are dates when incredible things happened, which are, Mashiach, as I said earlier, it's a process. It's not a one revelation of one person at one time. It's an accumulation. And these accumulations took place in each of these years, we hit powerful milestones. But what is finally the time when it's all supposed to end? So it's interesting. The Chafetz Chaim, okay, again from a non-Hasidic source. The Chafetz Chaim writes, what did I do with that paper? The Chafetz Chaim writes in his Sefer Choymas Hadas. The Chafetz Chaim was saying already, he lived pre-war, before the Holocaust. He writes that in our days, Ki is now the, the, the troubles and the suffering reached its peak. We can say this with absolute certainty. That the time of the end of days have arrived. So the Chafetz Chaim is saying this in about the 1920s. So now, let us do tshuva and get it done. And then he writes on the bottom, a note. 
when I say that the time of Mashiach has come, I'm not pinpointing a day. He says, because I can't do that. I can't pinpoint you a, perf- a, per- a perfect time. But on the general time, he says, There's no doubt that the times that we're going through, now he lived even before the Holocaust, but he must have seen the Holocaust, but even just the suffering of the Jewish people during the time of the first world war and the period in between of the first world war and the second world war and the communists and the, and the pogroms in Russia and all that that was going on he says without any doubt it's Hevle Mashiach the birth pangs of Mashiach who shenaskayim by kol asimonim that it says in the Gemara regarding this time how long it's going to take he says we don't know and he brings an interesting thing because it's possible he says even the time of Be'ita Be'ita means a set time also has, it's not one day. Be'ita, the set time, is also a period, which we can make it, that's the meaning of, he says, Be'ita achishena, that even in the Be'ita, it can come quicker, or it can come, it can come further. It's not, It could take, it could take a few months, he says, like in Golos Mitzrayim, Moshe Rabbeinu came, and then he disappeared, and then he came again, so he said it can take a, a while, or it could take a few years, it can happen in the beginning of this time, in the middle or in the end. But the Chafetz Chaim clearly stated in his time that we've already arrived. So you see clearly from the Chafetz Chaim that he's not holding and he's not of the opinion that Mashiach comes the last day of Friday. That doesn't make any sense. And why was he saying in his days, we're talking 300 years earlier, that it's Chevle Mashiach. It's already the birth pangs of Mashiach. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe came out with very, very strong letters during the time of the Holocaust that the suffering that the Jewish people are going through are without any shadow of a doubt, the birth pangs of Mashiach. Now, are you going to say that didn't happen? That's not true. Because it's a process. We, the Jewish people, went through a, a, a horrific purification, cleansing, and who knows what. The whole world went through a tremendous cleansing as a result of the Holocaust. But it was definitely related to the coming of Mashiach. Now, based on this theme, and I'm based on this theme, based on this theme, just to complete it all, after we've discussed this, this system of time, it leaves us with an amazing thing. Friday itself, Friday is a long Friday, there's a day, and if you count the day, and we know the most intense preparations for Shabbos, begin Friday at Chatzos, midday. Midday is when the main preparations for Shabbos start. Halachically, there are certain things that once it comes Shabbos Chatzos, there are certain laws pertaining to Shabbos in terms of that we're obligated to, to set aside everything else and prepare for Shabbos. So if we say 500 years is a period of time of, of um, a Friday, if we say 500 years is, is, is the daytime of Friday, so then we have to divide that in half to get the Chatzos. So that makes it 250 years, 750 years from the beginning of the fifth millennium. And that brings you to the year 1990. Tav Shinnon, the year 1990. The year 1990 is when we actually reach the year of Friday. In other words, if there's ever a period of time that Mashiach has to come, it's in 1990. 1990. So it's almost like that's the year. And I'll, I'll quote you a very interesting thing. The Rebbe in that year, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, in, I'm just going to conclude with this, in Parshas Tazriya Metzairah, in Tavshinun, a year, he says, In this year, Mamish, in Siyumay Shal Chaydish Nisan, with the conclusion of the month of Nisan, the Rebbe gives a very specific time, with the end of Chaydish Nisan, in the year 1991, Kalu Kalakitzim Kipshutai Mamish, that literally all the kitzim from Mashiach has ended. In other words, the time that the Bar Benel says, man chiyuv biyoyo, he needs to come, has arrived on Friday when we reach midday. The Mashiach must arrive during that time. Now, Be'ezer Hashem in the future classes, I'm going to discuss this. I'm just going to say one word and then we're, we're, we're just, just to complete the, the idea. And that is that in 1990, in, 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 a, in an unbelievable way, Geula came to the world. In, in, in a huge way, basically. First of all, we see that throughout our entire history, 
Jews were persecuted and Torah and mitzvahs, we could not observe our mitzvahs the way we want across the planet. Different oppressions, different people, we always had oppression. The first time in Jewish history started in the beginning of the 19, in, in, in the 1930, 19, after the Holocaust, 1950, in America, places like this where Jews are given the full freedom to be able to behave Jewishly. And not only that, it used to be in the early days of the, even in America that Jew, a Jew with a beard, a Jew who's keeping Shabbos, felt very uncomfortable, was not desired, was rejected. And then suddenly this magnificent thing happened in America today that not all, Jews are tremendously successful. And, they, and, and we can keep our Torah and mitzvahs openly. And so it, it suddenly began from around the 1950s and onward across the entire world. But during this entire period of time, there was one part of the world that held a third of the Jewish people in an iron grip. That was the last remnant of Golas, in a sense of oppression and dominance of the Jewish people and not allowing them to do a mitzvah that Jews had to be most nefesh to do a bris milah. You had to do it in hiding. It was a dangerous thing. And in 1990, mysteriously, without a war, without one shot, gun shot fired, boom! The Soviet regime collapsed and millions of Jews were given permission to leave and if they wanted even to go to Eretz Yisrael. That's huge. That itself is in a sense, you can see the goal is broke. Now, do we have Mashiach Tzitkenu fully revealed and all the miracles happening? No. Did something else happen during that time, 1990, and the years following that? Of course. A lot to talk about. But what we see is that we reached in 1990 when it became, we're talking about the, this great calendar of time. Yes, there is a calendar. 1990, the year 5750, is the, the main transition from exile to redemption happens at that time. The question is only, we're here 28 years later and we're still talking about Moshiach and we haven't yet had, and in between all this period of time, we've had antifadas, we've had so much suffering, we have BDS, we have so much Jew hatred in the world and so on and so forth. That's a good question. Bez Hashem, we're still gonna talk about that. But the idea that we've reached the very end of time for the Geula to come and that the time has passed already, is a definite. And again, there is so much more sources for me to share with you. The time just doesn't allow it to do that. So Bez Hashem, some of what we spoke today, clarifying in terms of what happened during all these periods of time, we're still gonna do in the future classes. Bez Hashem, come join us next week. Bez Hashem on um, the next class, which is titled The Big Ideas, which is basically to re re showing, connecting these time periods with Moshiach events happening in the world during that whole period of time. Meanwhile, until next week, Bezos Hashem, we will have the full redemption and we won't have to talk about it. See you, Bezos.